Devo here from the Axiom Body Piercing Studio in Des Moines, Iowa. Located inside the lovely Skin Kitchen. And coming up next, Body Piercing Tools. When it comes to body piercing, we use a lot of tools that are involved in the process of piercing and also changing jewelry and etc. And I thought it'd be interesting to kind of go through some of those basic tools that we use every day. Um, of course, this is a mayo stand. Um, it, it works as a setup. The trays are removable, easy cleanable surface. Um, usually we'll put down a drape or in this case a dental bib on top of that to kind of add an extra layer of protection. Uh, they are moisture resistant um, and then when we do lay out the equipment we tend to open up the sterile packages, lay them down and then set whatever we're using on top of those sterile packages because the inside of the, the package is still sterile. So here's some basic ones. Probably the first and foremost most common particular piece of equipment we use is body piercing needles. Now, these are single usage. Once they're used, they're pretty dull and they're disposed of. Not only are they contaminated, but they're disposed of as medical waste. They basically have a lance tip to them and what they do is when they inject into the piercing or in through the tissue to make the piercing, they make a crescent moon incision that the jewelry fits into. Unlike medical needles, which usually is determined by the inside, the hollow part, with piercing needles, it's determined by the outside thickness of the jewelry, or the thickness of the needle. In this case, we're looking at a 12 gauge needle. So this would be used for anything that we're going to put 12 gauge jewelry in. Um, a lot of people have the misconception that this somehow cores it, like you're taking some type of sample core. The reality of the situation is it usually doesn't. There is always going to be some bodily fluids that are going to inject into this. There's also going to be probably um, some tissue that's going to be in there, but we're not coring it out. We're not drilling through your tissue. There's not a little piece of you that stays with this. Um, the other thing is, is it's basically like a normal hypodermic needle. The only difference is a hypodermic needle that you would use at for like a, an uh, IV or what have you would have a hub on it to attach to whatever equipment that's going to be done, used. Second thing is cork. These are natural corks. Um, there's also rubber corks that I use occasionally depending on what availability and what, I'm, what I can get. Um, corks are very important because they allow not only to support the back of the piercing so that you don't get the bowing effect when the needle goes through, um, they also help uh, put your finger or put some pressure in an area behind the piercing that you uh, don't want to uh, put your finger in. So it's kind of like the thimble or thimble of body piercing. Um, also it's used to uh, put on the tip of the needle, for example, like so, so that when we're injecting the jewelry through, if we're in a tight spot where there might be some more uh, body parts around, we don't have to worry about scratching or damaging anything else. So it kind of helps in that way. Um, next up is the taper pin. This particular taper pin is a 8 gauge taper pin. <coughs> Fairly long one. And basically what a taper pin is, is one side is usually anywhere from 4 to 6 eight, uh, anywhere from four to six roughly um, gauges thinner, while the other side is the desired length. So when we say eight gauge, we're talking about the long side of it. And what this is used for is stretching piercings, um, primarily. That was its initial use uh, in inserting jewelry. A lot of times in a situation where, depending on where it's at, especially with a lot of ear piercings in places where you're dealing with tight areas, these are used, thinner ones of this, of course, to insert jewelry because you can guide the jewelry into the piercing. Also, um, it's used in the piercing process in some cases where we have to pierce, let's say, into an area, like let's say a helix, 
um, and then we're using Lebray jewelry which has a flat back on the back so what we'll do is we'll pierce this way push the needle out with the taper pen and then hook the, the jewelry on the other end and then push it back through um, it's also kind of a, a thing that's used if it's a situation where one of the most difficult parts, I guess, of any of learning piercing, and it occasionally happens even with the most experienced people, where you'll be piercing the, you'll you'll pierce it, looks great, fine, you'll put the jewelry on the other end, either uh, something moves or the person moves or the piercer makes a mistake, which we all do, we're human. This can be used as a taper pen, can be used to put back through the hole, line up those two holes, and insert the jewelry. Um, without having to re-pierce it again. So, very useful tool. Use a lot of these, especially in the 16-gauge uh, ones with a lot of the piercings that we do where we're piercing one direction and then pushing the jewelry in the opposite direction. Um, needle receiving tube. Basically what this is, a lot of times I'll put this on the tray, I'll be undoing all my packaging and the person's watching me do it, and I'll be like, is that the needle? No, it is not the needle. Uh, needle receiving tubes were originally designed mainly for Prince Albert piercings. And the reason being is that you needed to find a way to get into an area that you don't have access to to add support on the backside and also make sure that you didn't hit anything else. The old method was kind of to peel back the area and kind of slowly insert it. Uh, probably if you look hard enough online, you'll probably find some of the old gauntlet how-to videos. That's how they did it. Needle receiving tubes are kind of a big advancement because you can insert it into that area, line it up with the piercing hole by just feeling it, because it's kind of a thin area, and then inject the needle in and through. So it works as a, a way to do, uh, it's used in septum piercings, nostrils sometimes, some ear work. Um, it's also used as a way to guide the needle once the piercing's been done out of those tight areas especially in the ear where we're dealing with sometimes like with a dath piercing where we're dealing deep inside the ear we can do the piercing and then take this line up the needle and push the needle through without it having to worry about hurting or scraping or scratching anything else so it's a very useful tool from that standpoint um also used i, I use these on nostrils sometimes septums oh uh, dates, rooks, um, tracheuses, um, also clitoral hoods, the vertical ones of course, um, and Prince Albert. So it's a very useful tool that we uh, use quite a bit. Now we get into changing jewelry, some, some important things. Uh, we'll start off with uh, these, and these are the smallest ones I have. I use these usually for septum piercings if I need to do an adjustment on the uh, circular barbells after we've put it in and maybe it needs a little bit of adjustment so it can be flipped up. What these do is they expand when you squeeze them. So you line up, there's kind of ridges that you put the jewelry in and you can slowly expand it. You can apply about enough pressure to remove uh, mainly the captive bead rings. That's probably what they're primarily used as. There's small ones like these and there's big ones. It really depends on the thickness of the jewelry which ones I'll use because on the uh, thinner, on something like this, I'm not going to have enough leverage to open, let's say, a 2-gauge or a 4-gauge Cathy bead ring. So I need a lot more leverage. These, and these come in very similar designs, but this is probably the most heavy-duty pair that I have. This is for closing jewelry. Um, basically, mainly for Cathy bead rings, you basically has a long ridge on the inside on both sides. You line up the jewelry with that, and then you apply pressure, and it can squeeze the jewelry shut. So when you're working with like an area like say like um, a Prince Albert where you need a little bit more extra room to get the jewelry in or maybe a nipple piercing, once you've got it in there, then you use this to kind of close it and then put the ball on. Next up is hemostats. I use these more and more mainly because increasingly I'm dealing with more threaded jewelry. A lot of piercings that used to be done mainly, mainly with rings or just really weren't done that often were usually done with rings, so you didn't really need these. Now when you're dealing with threaded jewelry and even um, non-threaded jewelry, you need something to support the jewelry in a tight spot um, where you can't fit your fingers into. So we use these. These particular ones are mosquito ones. 
They're very, very thin. They're very good for like uh, changing jewelry for Le Bray piercings. Um, uh, if you uh, are anywhere you're wearing Le Bray jewelry, like in the mouth, um, the nostril, some people, and a lot of ear piercings. So very handy piece of tool, uh, very handy tool. And I do suggest that if you do handle um, or have a lot of threaded jewelry, that this is something you should have around the house um, if you need to change jewelry on a regular basis. Makes it a heck of a lot easier. Next up, Bollinger forceps. These are used mainly for tongue piercings. And the reason being is that they are a little wider so that you can clamp the area and insert the jewelry without having to take the forceps off. The other reason is that they have a little bit more ridges on them. They have a better grip. Uh, the only other piercing that I'll occasionally use this on is cheek piercings. Um, if you're thinking about getting cheek piercings, I really do think that you need to talk that through with your piercer. There is a lot of problems with them. Um, it's not something I really would suggest right off the hand. I'm willing to do, but I want you to understand the risks that are involved with it. They're just one of those piercings that are a bit on the risky side. Lastly, we have, um, well, two things, rubber bands. And you might be going, why the hell do you need rubber bands? And these are sterilized. Everything you're looking at today came out of a sterile package. Basically, if I would clamp this down on somebody, hear the click, there's three settings. That's going to hurt like bloody murder, and it's probably going to cause bruising and a lot of damage to the, and trauma to the piercing area. So, to avoid that, we don't use the locking mechanism. We use a rubber band wrapped around the forceps, like so. And that way, we can adjust the tension and still have it lock on the person. Instead of, uh, you know, we can move the rubber band up and down to adjust to see what's going to work best for them. Lastly, Pennington forceps. Though I don't use these as much as I used to, just basically because uh, style has changed. We're not doing as many uh, nipple piercings and navel piercings and uh, various other ones that these are really needed for. Though I would say a large variety of piercings are done with forceps. Uh, these particular style are the mini Pennington forceps. They have a slightly smaller um, profile so they can fit into tighter areas. Um, also increases like uh, accuracy because you have uh, less room to screw up. What forceps are used for? Um, the reason why we use them, I do, is that they do a couple different things. First up, they line up the markings of the piercing because as the body lays down or if, you, if you, they're marked in a sit up position, which they should be, and when somebody lays down, that might shift or move. So it allows you the ability to line up both those dots regardless of what the, uh, the state of the person is at that point, their anatomy. The other reason we use these is they flatten out the tissue, which gives the needle a shorter distance to travel, which does make the piercing less painful. The other primary thing for them is lining up those dots and giving you something that has structure and is supporting the tissue as you pierce it, which is gonna make the piercing faster and less painful because you're going to be cutting through instead of tearing through. So uh, it also allows you to move things and manipulate things to get it away from the body in a way that's going to make it easier to pierce and avoid hitting other parts of the anatomy. And that comes up on ear piercing sometimes, navel piercings, etc. So this is used on uh, forceps I use on pretty much any oral piercing. Um, also, uh, most of the, or some of the ear piercings, a lot of them I do freehand anymore. Nipple piercings, of course, navel piercings, and various different genital piercings. The biggest things with these is everybody always complains about how much they hurt. The reality is, is if they really, really hurt, and it's really painful, unless it's a very sensitive area like the nipples, the person who's doing it has it on too tight, and it usually will lead to bruising the next day. So that's what we're down to some of the more uh, common tools that you're going to be seeing in a body piercing studio and what they're going to be using on you. Uh, thank you for watching. I hope you learned something. Um, I believe that education and knowing things about what's uh, the process and what's going on 
helps to kind of eliminate some of the anxiety and I hope that helps in that direction. Um, if you have any questions, please make them and uh, feel free to comment here down below. Uh, please like the video. Uh, it's your way of saying, yay, I liked it. It's your way of applauding. Also, if you enjoyed this and you'd like to see more of my educational videos on body piercing, along with our weekly updates uh, that we do for the Axiom and Skin Kitchen, that includes Wesley and Jack's Tattoos of the Week, which is kind of cool. They, they pick out a tattoo they've done recently and then they talk about it. So it kind of gives you that kind of insight of what the artist feels about the work. Do subscribe then. Also hit the notification bell so that you're notified whenever we put up a video. Uh, the studio updates go up weekly, usually on Thursdays. Uh, these they go pretty much periodically. So it all comes down to when I have time to film it and then sit down and actually edit it. But other than that, have a good day and I hope to see you for your piercing needs in the future.